Greetings, everyone. So this is the uh, lecture on organism interactions. Um, what I want to kind of go through is think about how different organisms work together or work against each other, for that matter, um, in a community. Um, so, and the way we can think about this is by having um, looking at the positive and negative effects for each species. Now. Um, what we see is competition. That's our first interaction that I want to talk about. It's negative essentially for both species. So think about this lion here uh, with these hyenas, right? So we got one species, the lion, two, uh, the, the second species being the hyenas. Now, if they didn't compete with each other, right? If the lion was just there eating its prey, it would, do, it would get uh, more energy basically out of that prey because it wouldn't get any of the food stolen. It wouldn't have to waste energy scaring the, the hyenas away and the, the lion would, you know, get all of the food. But what we see is when two species have uh, similar enough like lifestyles, basically the population growth of one species is limited by the other species. And um, so let's think about then our next interaction, with it, which is positive and positive, which is called mutualism. This is kind of think about organisms, two, two species cooperating with each other. Now we see plenty of times when, um, you know, organisms of the same species, a uh, pack of wolves or a pride of lions, like whatever, right? That, that's pretty common. But it's, it's a little bit more rare for different species to be working together. Um, but it's where both species are benefiting. So if you look here, this is a coral. Uh, many of you may not realize, but that corals are actually tiny little jellyfishes that have a, um, a calcium shell around them. But so it's like a, this little transparent jellyfish, but inside the jellyfish is actually this algae that lives there. So, uh, you know, this is a, a relationship between these two species. The algae gets a place to live, gets nutrients brought in from the prey that the jellyfish, sorry about that, that the jellyfish um, brings in, uh, and it gets access to light. Uh, what does the coral get then? The coral gets the sugars that are produced by the plant. So the algae in here is photosynthesizing, creating sugars, and essentially about half of the calories that the jellyfish needs are the, from the um, from the algae. Um, most plants that you have around, either in your yard or in forests or pretty much wherever, live with this fungus. the The fungus pulls up water and nutrients, and the plant uh, and gives them to the plant, and the plant again gives the fungus sugars. So these are two examples of you know where the organisms are living together, but um, they don't have to live together, right? Uh, symbiosis is, this is, you know, symbiosis is basically a type of mutualism. Symbiosis meaning living, living together. Um, so they live together, same with the clownfish and the sea anemone, right? Uh, but um, they don't have to live together. Show an example of that here in a second. This is my favorite one. It's the pom pom crab. It's this little crab that puts these sea anemones on its um, on its claws and waves them around for protection. Another example uh, of mutualism are you know pretty much any pollinating insect or bird or something. Um, what this moth is doing is it's flying around looking for these orchids and it in, inserts its really long tongue basically down the flower all the way down to the bottom where there's nectar, sucks out that nectar. Meanwhile, it's pollinating that plant. So the next uh, interaction I want to talk about is predation. Now, predation is obviously very positive for the predator and very negative for the prey. Um, you know, the predator gains nutrients and energy, the prey loses everything. So it's not really, you know, that interesting to talk about the positives and negatives of that. But what I think is interesting is that predator avoidance mechanisms are super, super interesting. Um, so I took this picture um, in Costa Rica. This is a lot of people, th when they first think, see it, they think, oh, that's bird poop. 
but nope that is actually a tiny little caterpillar okay and it's camouflaged by looking at like bird poop as the caterpillar gets bigger it actually turns into this I didn't take this picture but when you first saw this you might have thought well there's a snake right but nope that's a caterpillar this is actually its butt its head is up here um, and it definitely looks like a snake so birds are not going to come after that um, you know the, at either stage at their younger stage they're not going to go after that because they think it's poop they're not going to go after that because it looks definitely like a snake so um, there's one of the reasons why these predator avoidance mechanisms are so interesting and so cool is because there's such strong natural selection, right? There is um, such a benefit in not dying, right? Like it's the ultimate negative to dying. So um, of course that selection would be extremely strong for them, for different species to evolve different um, strategies to not get eaten. You might have noticed this lizard over here, you might have not, but here is the mouth, eyeball, eyeball, and here is one that like the thumb and then the toes. You go up and here is the back leg right here with the tail. The point of the tail is right there. So that is a crazy looking lizard, right? Nothing is going to be able to find that pretty much. Uh, warning coloration is another thing so we that we see um, as a mechanism to avoid predation so the poison dart frogs these are a group of frogs that look super brightly colored and um, the, what they're essentially doing is hey don't eat me I'm poison that's what the color means um, and it's just a really good advertisement and a really good way for these frogs to not get eaten so, you know, what do you do when you see these insects? Do you go and pet them? No, you do not, right? You have an ingrained in your head that yellow and black insects means pain, right? So, um, you don't bother with them. Um, you know, a honeybee up here on the top left is, um, you know, the sting is extremely painful, fatal if you get enough of them. But um, here is a wasp, here is a hornet. But you might look at this guy and be like, oh, what is that? Um, this is fundamentally different than these other things. These are flies. They don't have a stinger. They don't have anything. But a lot of people are afraid of them because basically what they're doing is exploiting the yellow and black coloration of these other, other insects that we know are dangerous. So people just leave them alone. And it's a really cool adaptation to, to predation or to avoid predation. This is another example, you know, really cool lizard here. Um, here's the nostril. I don't even know where the eye is, I can't tell. But here's the front leg, here is the back leg then, and then here's the tail. Obviously very camouflaged for its area. So herbiv herbivory is another positive and negative um, interaction that we see between organisms. And, you know, um, it's pretty much predation on plants, but usually not fatal, right? Yeah, a plant can survive getting eaten. Um, a plant kind of has to survive getting eaten, right? Or at least part of it getting eaten because um, it can't really go anywhere. So how do plants deal with this? Well, you know, you've all seen thorns, maybe not a tree that's this covered in thorns, but um, the, the thorns on a tree or thorns on a plant, on, um, they uh, might prevent predator, like big predators or big herbivores, I should say, from eating the, the, the leaves of the plant. But they're not going to do anything to really small insects. Um, also, thorns might not work completely. It might just slow the organism down so it can't eat them as fast. It has to be careful and nip off individual leaves so you know the whole tree can't get stripped of its leaves all very quickly. Um, some other not so obvious maybe things of uh, responses to herbivory are things like lignin content. Lignin is this chemical that makes wood hard. So you know like a little dandelion or something is doesn't have any woody parts so it's it's not going to have any lignin in it uh, but actually grass can if it grows tall enough so 
it, it's pretty cool if you open like a whole big field of um, of grass and that hasn't been grazed for a long time and allow if you were to divide that in half and allow the cows to um, graze on one side and then you could compare the lignin content you'd actually see that the grass that the cows the grass that the cows just ate and then let's say the grass regrew has a lot more lignin in it so the cows are going to want to essentially go somewhere else to find some more luscious green juicy grass rather than the hard stuff that they they have been eating so it's um, an interesting mechanism to try to get a lot of things to not eat them then plants have a lot of really chemical interesting chemicals that they use so um, strychnine morphine um, nicotine nicotine is a great pesticide no insects pretty much eat the tobacco plant there's only one insect that can do it um, and um, so it really prevents insects predating upon them and they're able to um, grow a lot better and escape from herbivory. But interesting, a lot of the uh, spices that we use, peppermint, cloves, cinnamon, those are actually anti-predator devices or chemicals that um, we just think taste good. So, you know, we grow the plants, but most of the time they're um, the anti actually anti-predator devices. So parasites and pathogens, this is another positive and negative type of interaction. Uh, this is where we see one species living on another for, uh, for nourishment, right? And, um, you know, this could, we could think of this as pathogens, doesn't really matter whether we're talking about a bacteria that's living in your, on your skin, in your gut, or, you know, like a tapeworm, or even just like a mosquito or something, right? Um, the life cycles of these parasites are oftentimes really, really interesting so that they can um, have to jump from host to host to host, different species so that they can complete their life cycle. But, um, yeah. So, the, um, the last type of organism interaction I wanted to talk about was commensalism, which is a positive and no effect type of interaction, okay? Where one organism benefits and the other is unaffected. So think about these little birds here are called cattle egrets. Well, they're not actually that little next to this cow. They're, they're pretty big birds actually. But um, the cattle egrets just kind of follow cow, cow, cows around. Um, and what the cow is doing as it's grazing and eating up the grasses, what you might imagine is grasshoppers kind of just get scared and fly away, right? Get out of the way. They don't want to get stepped on by the cow. But then the cattle egrets can go after those those grasshoppers that get, uh, uh, you know, that fly up. And then the cattle egret benefits. The cow doesn't care, right? That cattle egret, the, not going to bother the cow at all. Um, another example are remoras and sharks. So this little remora attaches to the bottom of a shark and then the sh when the shark eats and the little pieces of food get, uh, you know, ripped off, the remora can then grab onto that food. And the shark wasn't going to eat those tiny little pieces of food that are, you know, being ripped off. Um, the sh shark's mouth isn't really like made for that. So the shark doesn't really care. You could say, well, it's somewhat parasitic because, you know, it takes a little bit of extra energy for the shark to move that remora, but, you know, honestly, not very much. Um, same with, like, bar whale barnacles. The whale doesn't care that there's those these barnacles that are having a place to live. You know, barnacles, it's good for the barnacles because they have a place to live, but, you know, unless the whale gets, like, totally covered in, in whale bar in barnacles, it's, it's not going to be a problem for them. I think my favorite commensalist is the eyelash mite. And yes, this is on humans. Um, they're very, very small little mites that live in your eyelashes. Um, and sometimes in your eyebrows. Um, and what we see is about people in their like early 20s, about 20% 20 of the people have them. So a decent number of you taking this class probably have these things. And um, as you age, you have a higher probability of getting them. Um, <coughs> excuse me. 
uh, what they do is they kind of burrow in around at the bottom of your eyelashes, eating the oils and the dead skin cells. Um, they're totally fine. They don't cause disease. They don't cause any really problems, and people can live with them forever. Um, but, you know, I just think they're the coolest commensalists. So um, take some time Googling them. You don't need to get rid of them. You'll be just fine if you do have them. But on that note, I hope you enjoyed this lecture and are not too freaked out about eyelash mites.